welcome the Queen's County School Board uh, meeting for June the 15th. Do I have a motion to go to closed session? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County will meet in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction. Any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. Second. A motion second. All of us say aye. 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 We'll be back in session at five o'clock for our second. Thank you. Right. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County uh, Work Session Board Education for June the 15th, 2022. Can we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Members, you've had a chance to uh, view the agenda of a motion. Motion to approve the agenda as presented, sir. Second. Approved and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Okay, the next thing will be approval of minutes for June the first closed session. Everybody had a chance to look at those? Yes. Motion to accept, uh, to approve the minutes for June 1st closed session, sir. Second. I have a motion, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 I've also had a chance to look at the uh, open session for June the 1st. Has everybody had a chance to look at those? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. A motion, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. We have some people in our audience that are going to, we want to recognize. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Okay, it's going to be it's going to be until we get to 501. If you don't mind, just hold on a second. They're trying to keep me straight. Okay, uh, our next one will be educational facility master plan, Carla Barland. President Smith, members of the board, Dr. Salins and executive team. My name is Carla Pullen. I'm the facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I'm here this evening to outline for you quickly the educational facility master plan. Got it, thank you. So tonight we're going to look at the role of the Educational Facility Master Plan in our state funding process for construction funding. We'll look at the schedule for the submission process. You've been given a draft version of the Educational Facility Master Plan for 2022. And I just wanna make you aware that at the July 13th meeting, we'll be asking for your approval to use this as our working document for the next year. So as part of the capital improvement program, that's our construction funding, we have two pieces to the puzzle. The first is the educational facilities master plan. And that is essentially a long range look at what we're gonna need for our facilities. We look out seven to 10 years at our facility needs. We do a yearly update once a year. We look at our enrollment projections, and with that, that tells us what our facilities are gonna need in the next seven to 10 years. And then we try to outline the future projects that we foresee. The second part of this funding process is our CIP, and you'll be seeing this from us in September. It's our funding request, and we will be looking then at fiscal year 24. We also look at what our anticipated funding requests are gonna be for seven to 10 years out from that. So the state is aware of what to expect over the next several years. We establish timelines for our projects. Along with the educational facility master plan, then we prioritize what those facility needs are gonna be. And then we decide what the funding request will be to the state. This next slide just outlines that this is a Comar requirement to participate in the capital improvement program and to get that funding from the state. We are required to submit this document once a year. 
information that's covered in the educational facility master plan is pretty much prescribed. There are required documents that we must give to the state to be eligible for this funding. We look at our educational goals, standards, and guidelines. And this year, we have some pretty, pretty exciting updates to the mission of Queen Anne's County Public Schools, the vision, the core values, and the goals. And I believe Mr. Kibler, Dr. Kibler, and his team are going to talk to you about that in a little while. We look at the curriculum and how it's provided our applicable policies, school organization. We look at how we organize by grade, how we organize by location. We look at how we transport students and what those policies are. In the event that we have to redistrict, that is outlined in this document. We review our enrollment projections through the next 20 years, and we make sure that those concur with what the Maryland Department of Planning is seeing, as well as what Queen Anne's County Planning is seeing. The Queen Anne's County government works in conjunction with us to look at the current demographics in Queen Anne's County. We look at people who are migrating in and out of the county and what those projections look like for the next several years. We also look at the infrastructure of the county, and this includes building permits for the last year as well as new subdivisions, so that we're kind of tipped off to what we may be looking at in terms of facility growth. We have a facility inventory that we maintain and we look at this yearly. That also includes the school boundaries and whether they're still relevant. And then the facility needs, the utilization is a big portion of this document. We want to see what percent each facility is utilized and how that looks for the next 10 years. With that, it's going to tell us what our facilities need to do to accommodate. Something new this year that we've never looked at before are our pre-K population projections. Based on the enhanced pre-K programs that the blueprint is requiring, we know that we're, we're anticipating there will be some requirements for the buildings that will be different in the next few years. Some dates, these are static dates every year. The Educational Facilities Master Plan goes to the state in July. The capital improvement plan, that actual request for funding, will come back to you in September to go to the state in October. And then in February, we start to talk again with the county government about what that match will look like from our county partners. So just for clarification, the board doesn't need to approve this tonight because they can move to approve it. July 13th, even though it says June. Yes. As long as it gets to the state by June, July 30th. That's correct. Okay. We will submit to the state on July 1st with the document that we have in hand. And what we will give to them on July 14th is your letter saying you've reviewed it. If there have been any changes at that point, we'll submit those along to the state as well and just let them know. So when will we get our copy of this to review? We'll be able to give that to you on the 14th as soon as it's with the meeting on the 13th after we've received any comments from you we will give you our copy of the final document if there's anything we need to discuss at the july 13th meeting if anything else has come up we'll make those changes before that's submitted as final and so july 14th we'll be able to give you your final document portion of this slide is just to discuss our capital funding. As you know, those funds become available to us on July 1st of each fiscal year. For planning and design, it's changed a little bit in the past year or two in that the state is now participating with some of that, which is good news for us. And of course, for any of our major building projects, we're normally coming to you to request funding for that one to two years in advance because we have a lot of planning that goes into that before construction actually begins. So here's the next steps, here's the calendar. Tonight, we are talking about what this document is. You have a draft available to you for review. I'd request that if you have any comments, that you get those back to me by June 29th, and we will incorporate those into the document that you see on July 13th. If for any reason there are more comments after that, that's no problem. We'll make sure that they're incorporated before that final goes to the state, and we'll let the state know of any modifications that have been made, and then we'll submit that to the Maryland Department of Planning on July 14th. July 14th. 
I did provide to you a document that is a summary of changes. Just to let you know, some of this information is somewhat static each year. Some of it does change pretty frequently, especially our enrollment projections, our building utilization, any of the numbers that are coming from the county we try to update. And so we've um, listed those either in red or they are shown in the Word document with the modifications made next to that. You'll see it in some places. There's quite a bit of text that has been modified. We will update that for your final view on the 13th, but right now we want you to be able to easily identify the items that have changed. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have this evening. We'll look at it and probably you know, digest some of this stuff. Yes. It's awful hard to digest stuff one day and do it the next. Um, July 13th, we have a meeting. We also have one July the 20th. If things got going on, we could do that July the 20th since it's not due to July the 30th. Is that correct? Or is July the 14th a date, a solid date? July 13th should be the solid date because I will submit this to the state on July 1st. They request that we have this document to them at the beginning of July. So our hope had been for the first week in July, we're not meeting during that time. So we'll do that on the 13th. If indeed it would have to go to the 20th or to the following meeting, we'll certainly request that from the state. So we could do that. And if, if since we did move our meeting from the July 4th week, if we could get that stuff, everything that week early as possible, it yes. just gives the board members more time to get back to you and ask questions that, you know, if we need to get a, a approval by the 13th. Certainly. Okay. Any other questions by board members? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to request if we could move one action item up, Human Resources Report 501, if the board would approve an agenda, because we do have some people in the audience and we have a long uh, meeting tonight. Would that be possible? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to amend the agenda to move 5.01 to 4.02? Second. I have a motion, a second, also in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the amended agenda? Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. Mr. Smith, 4.02, may I make a motion to accept the human resource and substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session? Second. All members have had a chance to look at that and review it. Do you have any other questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Dr. Salem. Great. Yes. <laughs> so we do have several guests here this evening. and. Um, I know, hopefully I don't miss anybody because some people could come and some people couldn't, but we have quite a number of folks that are joining um, our administrative um, team and we're super excited about that. So I kind of just want to go down the line. They're not in any special order. And again, I hope that I don't miss anybody. Should we go um, down and? Yeah, so I'm gonna take my laptop. I'd like to recognize and ask her to come up is Mrs. Cheryl Cox. She is our new supervisor of instruction, um, early childhood. We're so excited to have her. She's coming to us from Anne Arundel County, and she's bringing quite a skill set with her. So congratulations. Thank her. you. So in the central office, but we'll be out at schools a lot because of all the different hats that she'll have on. She is a local resident, by the way, too. So she's, you know, we pulled her over and uh, out of the out of the ranks of Anne Arundel County. So I'm excited for that. Um, the second person I'd like to recognize and have come up is Rebecca Ben Aiken, and she will be our new assistant principal at Centerville Elementary School. So, and just a little background there that we do have, um, that's okay, so we had um, teacher specialists in all of our elementary schools and um, looked at the value of adding assistant principals at elementary schools. So this year we're starting it with kind of more of a pilot where we have four schools that are we're doing that. So we're going to see a series of those as well. The, the next person I'd like to, um, to have come up is Miss Sarah White. 
and she will be the new assistant principal at Mattapik Elementary School. Principal is here. She, if you want to come up, come in and join. Okay. It's her day. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Thank you again. We're very excited. Very, very excited. And the next person I'd like to invite up is Miss Tiara Hoffman, who will be the new assistant principal at Graysonville Elementary. <laughs> when I went there the other day. It was so cute. I was like, so excited. Thank you. And her principal's here as well. Her principal's here as well. So I just oh, oh yeah. sitting right next to her. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, and her new principal here that we recognized last time yeah. at our board meeting, Mrs. Tubbin. And, um, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the next person I'd like to invite up is Miss Kristen Furlock, who will be a new um, assistant principal at Queen Anne's County High School. Yeah. And yeah, you're excited, and we're excited for you. <laughs> And the next person is Miss Rebecca Berberich. I hopefully I said that right. <laughs> and she will be the new assistant principal, um, taking the place of Mrs. Tubman at Sadlersville Middle School. Yeah. So, yeah. We planned that. Yeah. <laughs> person that we would like to recognize is Mr. Marchetto who is moving to a new family within our district to Centerville Middle School. So. I know that they're looking forward to you coming over to their family. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I think I didn't miss anybody. Did I miss anybody? Do you want to take a picture with everyone? Sure. Want to do a group? Sure. That'd be great. Oh, Lana can take care. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. way we can send it to the Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you want to mention the ones that weren't that aren't here? Or not? No, I'll just do a news release. Okay. Yeah, I mean I could, but I'll just do a news That's release. Good. Yeah, we do have others, but they weren't able to be here tonight, and we certainly will be. Lana's working on a news release, so we'll get that out for everybody. Oh, Good evening, President Smith, board members, and Dr. Salins. I am Amanda Enzer, um, the Family Engagement Specialist for QAC, and this is... And I'm Christine Bentley, our Equity Specialist. And we're here to um, inform you of a grant award that we've, been, we've received from MSCE, the Maryland Leeds Grant. So tonight, yeah, our purpose is to inform you about the, and the public about um, the award, the Maryland Leeds Grant from MSD, and we are gonna provide you with a brief overview of the grant activities under the seven high-level strategies um, and what some of those activities will, or that will be implemented through the grant. So just a little bit of background as to where Maryland Leeds came from. This is a um, grant that was afforded to the MSDE through ARP ESSER funds. Um, this is intended to overcome learning loss resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it also has specific goals to accelerate student learning and provide more targeted support for those historically underserved students in their communities, our community. Um, this is a two-year grant cycle. We've been awarded at $6.6 .6 million. And um, the two-year period is ending on September 30th, 2024. 
So this is just a brief slide to show you what those high level strategies. So um, in the application for this grant, you were able to pick and choose which strategies to apply for and Queen Anne's County decided to apply for all seven. And we were granted all seven high level strategies and the funding attached to those seven strategies. So each of the seven strategies included specific focus areas that we were requested to align to, in some cases required to align to, at least one of those for each of these. Um, the first strategy is what is referred to as our grow your own strategy. And with that, you see here that we've outlined some of the activities that are going to take place aligned with those MSTE focus. Um, particularly for us, we're looking at developing career ladder pipelines, um, incre in increasing the number of um, certificated staff that we have by looking at our current school assistant positions or other support staff positions for those individuals who may be interested in that professional development to become a certified certified teacher in our or um, social worker social worker or counselor within our community. The second high level strategy that we had applied and were awarded for is staff support and retention. And staff support and retention is really looking at those opportunities to enhance the well being of our staff and um, across the board and in many different ways. We've taken this area to um, focus specifically on employees, employees' health and wellness. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about one of our partners with that later on in this meeting. Um, and then also looking at our professional development models to better support the um, professional needs and to better build the capacity of our employees and as well as looking at some of the financial incentives that this grant um, funding has afforded us. High quality school day tutoring and um, it's important to note here that some of these strategies have areas that are specifically aligned with the focus areas that have been recommended or required by MSDE that are then also weaved with or braided with other strategies because there were specific funding allocations that were allowed in certain strategies that were not allowed in other strategies. So we looked at it as an opportunity to overlay some of those goals. So in high quality school day tutoring, school day being the imperative at that one, is really looking at those additional staffing opportunities that we have to be able to build um, opportunities to close those uh, COVID related learning loss or um, to actually be able to provide accelerated or enrichment. Now when we talk about tutoring, tutoring under this strategy, it's not necessarily limited to what we might refer to as simply academic tutoring. This could include a component as well, uh, uh, such as mentoring um, or other type of school assistant roles to provide the support of, of our needs in, during the school day. And this also is braided with our grow your own strategy, which um, is related to building that pipeline to if we have um, support staff who are currently in those support roles that we're looking to um, climb that career and use those pipelines to become into certificated roles, backfilling those positions as well so that we're not losing capacity with our human resources. The reimagining use of time. This is really looking at restructuring our school days and getting creative to meet the needs of our 21st century kids post COVID. Um, and this is looking at building some opportunities to increase career and college exploration at our middle school level and so introducing our students at an earlier age to those career opportunities that they might be interested in engaging in in high school, as well as providing opportunities within the school day to be able to support some more of that um, academic needs outside side of traditional instruction. So looking at building in time during our middle school such middle school schedules to be able to provide some more creative opportunities to meet students needs and interests. And at the high school level, it also provides us an opportunity to look at activities that would allow for enhanced um, and increased ability to for credit recovery or to pursue enrichment or other activities that don't necessarily fit within the high school traditional schedule or with some of the schedules for the needs of our students. Uh, so the next strategy is the innovative school models. Um, and just to highlight a few things, this is really looking at expanding our early college model in collaboration with our IHEs, Chesapeake College and Washington College, hopefully, um, and provide more opportunities to earn, co earn college credit while um, being enrolled in high school. In addition, uh, we really focused on our CTE program under this strategy and increasing as, as many <laughs> opportunities, access and opportunities to CTE programming. Um, one of the things we have 
have in there and hope to this will support in the future is that um, establishment of a standalone CTE building program in Queen Anne's County. That was something we really focused on under this, this strategy. And can I just jump in there one minute? We've, we've kind of see in the bullets here that we refer to that as with a school within a school model. So this funding um, does not allow us to fully develop or build out that separate career center CTE facility. But what we do hope to be able to do with CTE within this is to be able to create that structure so that when we pr create the infrastructure, so when the physical capacity is for us, we have that established as its programs that can just be moved into a physical space that would then enhance and expand those in the future. Yeah, and I think it's also important. We, you know, we worked very closely with Adam Tolley and the supervisors, CNI, and the exec team as we went through this, and and all the admin um, across the district as we were looking at these high leverage strategies to determine what it is that was really needed in each of the schools and what would have the greatest impact on our students. So this next one is transforming neighborhoods through excellent community schools. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the community school movement. This is um, MSG's current model under that. But the purpose of this is to create more community partnerships and resources um, in the school to provide our families more um, be wellness resources, health, anything within that school community. In addition, it is looking at implementing a more comprehensive family engagement model um, at all of our schools, very similar to what our Title I schools currently have, and then just ensuring we are, are creating an environment within our school communities that have a collective impact overall on everybody inside and outside that building. And this one, um, the science of reading, is the last high leverage strategies, strategy. This is looking at and training all K through three teachers, including special ed teachers, principals, and other re relevant staff in the theory and practice of the science of reading. And this is where we are kind of moving within the next two years to what reading instruction, the, the model will look like, instructional strategies will look like. So this is gonna allow us to pilot um, this program and this these particular instructional tools and materials that are aligned to the science of reading in the next two years and really start to train our K through three teachers to be prepared for that um, complete transformation come 2024. I just wanted to um, also talk about the partner process for this. So this was somewhat of an unconventional process in terms of the application for Maryland Leads. And one of the components that was included in this is all of these strategies, or not all of them, most of these strategies have a partnership requirement. And the partners that we are aligned to with these different strategies were selected by MSDE. They also had to participate in an application process. And then we were provided a list of partners for which we could choose from that best aligned to the activities that we had written into the grant. So um, we were able to and fortunate to be able to work with some of our partners here locally and they have been approved. That would include Chesapeake College and Washington College. So we're looking forward to working with some of the partners that we are, are known to have worked with and have established relationships with as well as looking at new partners who were approved through this process who were chosen by the state to be best aligned and be able to best serve our needs for, for completing this work. And with those partners, one of the largest components is a, um, a needs assessment up front. It's, it's really diving deeper and bringing out that outside partnership to come in and help us even better determine what our, you know, what our school system needs. And, and we have had conversations with some of those consulting partners that would be able to provide that piece. And all of the ones that we've, with, that we've had conversations with have been interested and willing to align with the work that Ms. Hudock and Dr. Kibler have done because a lot of the pieces of of this particular grant application was very intentionally aligned with what we're moving towards, towards blueprint. This is a two year limited, has an expiration date on a lot of dollars. So the activities that we invested in with these are really for building capacity, trying to build our staff to be able to sustain that within our own capacity in our district beyond that period of time when these funds run out moving into blueprint. Mm -hmm. That's great. great, thank you. Thank you. It's fabulous. Thank you so questions much. Questions by the board? Any other? No, yeah, good job getting those seven grants. I know that <laughs> takes a lot of money and effort and everything else and incentive. So congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you so much.
Okay, our next one will be uh, statewide parent recognition. That's me again. Okay. <laughs> um, so I wanted to come and inform the board of this incredible accomplishment of one of our Latino parents from Southersville Elementary School. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, Southersville Elementary School has the only statewide family engagement center for family literacy in the state of Maryland. It's a partnership with the National Center for Families Learning and the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. And so it is a two-generational approach to teaching literacy. Um, and as you are familiar with the population of Southersville Elementary School. Currently, the 18 families enrolled in this program this year were all EL families, all Latino families. With that being said, one of our biggest partners is MELFIN, which is the Maryland EL Family Involvement Network. And every year, they put out um, a parent recognition award and, and a nomination for this. So it's the John Nelson Parent Involvement Matters Award. Um, it's an annual award for an immigrant parent whose exemplary con contributions to Maryland public schools have led to improvements for Maryland public school children, schools, and districts. And then it gives the five areas where nominees must demonstrate involvement. So welcoming all families, encouraging partnerships, supporting student learning and success, building capacity among st school stakeholders, and promoting effective school family communication. So Edwin Escalante, um, I nominated him for this award along with um, Elizabeth Miller, the director of the Judy Center at Southersville Elementary School, and Tom Walls, who had worked with him previously at Southersville Elementary School. And we were very proud that he was selected as the statewide winner for this, for this award. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little bit about him. He's an excellent example of a father who's dedicated to his daughter's education in the greater community. He speaks with honesty and passion about the needs of our students and families. He quickly realized the immediate needs of our community's families during this pandemic and specifically shared them with those of us who had the resources to help. So I really couldn't think of a more deserving candidate for this award and it was, it was pretty incredible to see one of our um, QAC parents recognized at the state conference. And there is a picture. His daughter, Katherine, was in kindergarten this year, and she will be in first grade at Southersville Elementary School next year. And both he and his wife are enrolled in our literacy program. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that this evening. Thank you. Nice to hear positive things. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, next will be English Learner Staffing Plan. I wanted to preference this as, um, as right before we get started that the state of Maryland requires us to do a special ed staffing report that comes to you every year and must be approved by the board. Um, and it's a very good process to go through every year to take you know the time and effort um, that they do for special ed to look through staffing and ensure that every school is properly and appropriately staffed to meet the needs of the students that are in that school. And as we know, our students ebb and flow between the different um, grade bands. And so that's why looking at staffing every single year is very important. The process is such a good process that I went and asked them to do the same kind of exercise for our EL population. As we know, that population is growing. Our staffing is growing. We put five new positions in this year. And so um, it, it's getting to be larger and larger. And, and, it, and it should be our due diligence every year to um, take a fine tooth comb and look through it to make sure that we have the appropriate staff at every building. So, um, so this will be one of many years that we'll just continue to build on and look through. And I thank you up front for the time and energy you put into this, because I know it's a lot to, um, to orchestrate and it really is orchestrating staffing across um, all buildings. So thank you. All right, well, good evening, President Smith, Dr. Salings, board members, and executive team. Um, I'm Michelle McNeil, the supervisor of early learning, reading K-2, Title I, Title Three, and migrant from curriculum instruction. So the purpose of today, and you know, Dr. Salings kind of shared a little bit already, but I would like to share with you our current um, English learner staffing plan for Queen Anne's and then show you what um, we're looking at for the 2022-2023 school year with the addition of the five new positions um, that we have put into the budget. So this just gives you a little bit of an overall where we are with our um, student enrollment. You can see that um, we have high enrollment in the elementary schools at Sellersville Elementary and at Graysonville Elementary. Um, 
our high school, our middle schools, Sellersville Middle, of course, our feeder school for Sellersville Elementary, and then um, Queen Anne's County High School has really increased to um, 52. We've had a lot of newcomers this year. So our current staffing plan, we have six teachers um, that we've been working with. One of those teachers is only 40% of her time. The 60% of her other time is um, an art teacher. Um, you can kind of see the breakdown where each teacher is assigned. Um, so that means they're moving from building to building throughout a full week, and they're trying to meet the needs of those numbers of students that you see there. Um, definitely, you um, you know, we have that one teacher who was at Centerville, the three Centerville schools plus Graysonville trying to service 89 students um, you know these students need that daily instruction and they're they're getting it just maybe two days a week for about 15 minutes because we have such a large um, population so with that being known um, we decided to talk about what our staffing plan would look like for the 2022-23 um, school year we decided to increase um, the certified teachers from 6 to 11 with that increase of certified teachers, that'll decrease the caseload for each of um, the teachers and allow more opportunities for student needs. Also, by providing an additional teacher at the high school will allow us for more push and support as well as direct instruction for our ESOL 1, 2, 3, and 4 classes. So from the state, um, we have to provide at the high school level um, ESOL classes um, as part of their schedule. So when you have one teacher teaching those classes, that does not leave that support in the classroom that those students might need. So we needed to add that additional um, teacher. So this is our proposed plan, but um, it could change. Um, we haven't um, put our teachers where they need to be yet because we're still looking at what our enrollment's gonna be. Some students um, did exit um, the program this year due to their WIDA access score, so we're working on that um, to determine. But based off of our transition, so you know, students going to the next grade or a different school, this is what our proposed um, staffing plan could look like. We do still have have a high number for that one teacher at Sellersville Elementary School. Um, the elementary school is um, a little bit different when you look at it from compared to middle and high school because those students can all be clustered of five or six in a class and they can meet the needs as a group. We're at high school and middle school because the um, students are moving from class to class. Um, it's not as easy to meet. Um, of our five positions right now that we have open, we have two filled. Um, so we're still looking for three more positions in order for this plan to work. If we don't get all five positions filled, this plan will not work and we will have to look at a different plan. I already have a couple of my EL teachers looking at how we can make this plan um, work if we don't fill all our spots. Um, so again, this is just a draft of where we could go with those additional teachers. You can still see our numbers are pretty high, but um, hopefully we can meet the needs of our students. Any questions? We have a lot of teachers applying for this, or is it just hard to get this? It, it's hard because it, it, it is an uh, additional certification okay. that teachers have. Um, you know, they're certified as a teacher, but then they also are ESOL certified. Um, so they do go through that additional program in order to get certification um, for it. Okay. So you give the example of an art teacher, and so she teaches her art classes, and then she's what moves down the hallway or to another school and but she was doing um el services at that school she was teaching art at um so right and are the other certified teachers that we have now in the same sort of no scenario? she was the only one at that time so um but that They're dedicated esol mm -hmm. teachers right when they come in yes yeah and so where do they have that student population for the whole day or is it an hour? No, it, it, um, they, they create a schedule um, for their week. Um, you know, so for ones that go to multiple schools, they may do, um, you know, three days at one school, two days at the other um, and work in um, their schedule. If the schools are close together, they may, you know, do both schools in a day. They just have to, you know, drive over, but, um, you know, they just have to schedule it out. So usually the students get service two to three days a week from it. And then last question, 
if a student is in an ES program or ESOL, um, let's say for a year, do they usually move on after that? Or like you said, they, it, I can't remember the term you right. use, but they. So it, in order for them to exit, they have to um, score 4.5 on um, the Access 2.0 um, assessment that all EL students take in January. Um, so it just varies on where they are on their levels. Um, you know, if they come to us right at the early grades and we can work with them, they usually can start exiting around third grade, fourth grade. But if you have students, newcomers coming to us right at high school, um, and they're scoring a 1.3, you know, it's a challenge, you know, to get them to that 4.5. So more than likely they won't exit, but we do see growth, um, you know, sure. for some of them. But the earlier they come to us, the more opportunities we can provide them to get to that 4.5 so that by the time they're getting to middle school, hopefully they're exiting out of the program. That could be the big. That should be the big challenge. I would say, if you're catching somebody in first or second grade, you're mm -hmm. building those foundations. But if you're catching somebody in middle or high school, yes, it, they've already, you know, they're they're so far not behind, but haven't had the time to get those skills they need to build up to that point. Mm -hmm. Must be a big challenge. It is. Composition <laughs> of language. It's uh, very challenging. Any other questions? Any question about the board? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Special Ed staff, Mrs. Smith. Apologize in advance, mine's not as, sh as short this year. <laughs> <laughs> I have big shoes to follow coming from Carolina County. <laughs> Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Salins, board members, members of the executive team. Uh, my name is Jolene Smith. I am the supervisor of special education for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And I am coming to you this evening to present the FY23 uh, Special Education Staffing Plan. Similar to what um, Mrs. McNeil said, you know, our enrollment is also very fluid and um, we have in the past couple of, couple of months received numerous referrals, um, both on our infant and toddler side as well as our school age side. Um, so this is our staffing plan, uh, but we do recognize that we, we do kind of reserve the right. Um, if we recognize a big in, influx in need, we may have to make adjustments, but we do that based on the needs of our students. Um, so the purpose of the spe special education staffing plan is to meet COMAR regulations as well as to follow the procedures outlined by the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, its purpose is to ensure appropriate ad and adequate personnel deployment to be able to provide a free and appropriate public education for all students with, with disabilities in their least restrictive setting. So on this slide, um, as you know, in Queen Anne's County, we have around 7,400 students. Um, about 800 of those students are students with disabilities, and this represents about 10% of our population, which is um, right in line with state and federal percentages. Um, so on this slide, each of our 14 schools are represented with their overall enrollment captured as well as the subgroup for students with disabilities and their enrollment and the percentage that each of these makes for each school. Those schools that are outlined in the orange uh, do have regional programs within them, either one of our ACE programs, PACS programs, PEELS programs, um, or our preschool programs, or in some cases more than one. And so when you see that the percentages might be a little higher than another school, School, it could be attributed to that. So here in Queen Anne's and really pretty much throughout the state, special education services are provided to children um, birth through the age of 21. And we do so um, by providing a very complete service delivery continuum. <coughs> This continuum ranges from inclusive services all the way over to self-contained regional programming, as well as programming for students um, outside of our schoolhouse walls uh, where we're not able to offer the services that they require. 
Um, as you can see, this is represented on a sliding scale because some of our students, or actually most of our students, don't fit on just one place on this scale, um, but they may need to kind of experience a myriad of environments in order to meet their needs. In addition to the, um, the different regional programs that are listed, as well as those, those special education settings, we also partner with the Midshore Special Education Consortium to deliver related services. Um, and those services may include occupational therapy, physical therapy, audiological services, as well as teaching uh, teachers for the visually and hearing impaired. So additional information related to the delivery of special education and related services can be found on page 11 in the, um, the narrative version of the staffing report that I provided. This presentation is kind of a description of what you find in the narrative version. So just to kind of take you um, on the path of a child uh, with a disability from birth all the way through 21, um, we begin that journey for our children with disabilities through our infants and toddlers population or program, sorry. Uh, this slide represents the total number of children receiving services. And as you can see, we serve um, 111 children between the months of July and March this year, with the largest group of children being between the ages of two and three years of age. At the age of three, families have the option to stay with the infant and toddler program on an extended individualized family service plan or an IFSP or to transition to school age services under an individualized education program or an IEP if appropriate. And currently we do offer and we're very proud of our blended preschool program. Um, and we, we offer this at Ken Island Elementary School as well as Centerville Elementary School. It's an opportunity for our students with disabilities to learn side by side with their typically developing peers in a very language rich environment um, so that they're afforded the opportunity to experience those school age um, expectations very early on so that when they hit that pre-K age, they're ready to go in with their general education counterparts. So this slide is actually once they go over um, into that school age um, service environment. So this is um, a representation of the same data that was represented on the slide with all the schools, but it's just presented in a different um, in a different way. You can kind of see the comparison of the students with special specially designed instruction um, compared to those with that are receiving services through general education. But I do want to remind you that. Um, um, our special education students are general education students first. So while they are represented in the blue bar, they're also represented in the red bar as well. So they are represented twice. Um, inside of your uh, narrative, you will see a chart that represents this data. And this is a historical view of our census based on the um, disability categorized categories identified by um, the IEP team. And you'll see that we've had a fairly consistent representation with most of our students being captured in that specific learning disability category, followed by the other health impairment and then speech language impairment. Um, we've seen a slight decrease in our specific learning disabilities and it's kind of countered by a slight increase in that other health impairment. Um, we, are, we have been found disproportionate in the area of specific learning disability for our students um, that are African American. And um, one of the things that I'll talk about in just a, in a minute is kind of how we're addressing that through the district as a whole. So we are and continue to be very proud that we are a very inclusive uh, district and um, we continue to exceed the state target or expectation of having 70% um, of our students participating in the general education setting 80% of the day or more. So our percentage is actually 84.9%. 
When you look at the historical picture there from 2017 to present day, you will see that our numbers have started to decline over time incrementally, but still they have started to, to decline. Um, and that is really representative of the increased needs that we're seeing with our students when they're coming through those schoolhouse doors. And it doesn't necessarily always equate to academic needs, but sometimes those social emotional needs as well. And our, our team and our, our special educators and all of the related service providers respond to that by providing the services where they need to be delivered. And sometimes that means in a slightly more restrictive setting for part of their day. And that's what kind of translates to that small incremental decrease there. But they, they really do continue to represent and be champions for inclusion for even our most, our students with the most complex needs. So um, kudos to them. So school districts are evaluated annually uh, to determine their ability to meet federal and state targets based on kind of predetermined indicators. So the state selects um, a, or has a myriad of different indicators that we have to meet and they determine the targets based on federal guidelines as well as state guidelines. And they have created a, a series of statuses that we can fall within. So the first one being meets requirements, the next one being needs assistance, needs intervention, and then needs substantial intervention. So annually we are given a report card and what you see here is our Part C or our infant and toddler report card where they tell us how we're doing in relationship to those targets and indicators that they have predetermined. So you can see here for our infants and toddlers on the right hand side for FY20, 2020, um, most of the indicators are green, which means that we met requirements there or we met the state target. There were two areas that we fell just shy of that. Um, but again, you know, I really, that's a tremendous report card right there. For our Part B data, um, you'll see that there's a little bit more pink, but there are also some pretty rigorous indicators in there as well, including um, our state testing requirements as well. Um, and really, uh, so same thing, the green is represented by meeting target and the pink being um, having not met those targets. You can see when you compare 19 to 20, that in some areas we were able to kind of recoup and, and become green from where we were pink. And there was one area where we became pink from green. Um, it's also important to note that this is lag data. So this is actually data from the 2019-2020 school year. And when I ran the data uh, for this report prior to um, presenting tonight, in a lot of these pink categories, we've actually already achieved the target. So we're, we're looking pretty good for next year. So what does that mean? That means that we continue to meet requirements. So we've historically always met requirements and happy to say we continue to do so. Um, it also means that we were placed in the universal tier. So there are four tiers for um, compliance measures and we were in the, the general supervision universal tier, which means that we did not have any findings of non-compliance or if we did have a finding of non-compliance, we had it corrected within a year. So um, again, very proud to say that we're doing well in, in that area. So where do we go from here? So some of our upcoming projects, and we as a special education department also created a strategic plan um, that we put in place at the beginning of last year, where we have a series of pre-identified goals and objectives to meet each year. It's a four-year plan for us, and it addresses a, a series of different topics from early childhood up to secondary transition. To kind of capture some of those, that's what's represented on the slide here. So for our earliest learners, um, we are developing school readiness or early learning groups for um, those students next year. They will be year uh, round offerings for student or for children twice a month where they will be invited to participate with typically developing peers in a classroom like structure so that they are given the opportunity to learn things like sharing and sitting during circle time and listening to the teacher. Things that we kind of take for granted but are very important for our little friends. Um, it will also encompass a, a, an element of parent training and coaching as well. We're going to continue to increase our teacher capacity for all of our students, especially for those with our significant cognitive disabilities. 
we will continue to work on compliance with the, the development and implementation of our IEPs and IFSPs. We are we have started and will continue to work on our response to intervention practices and ensuring that we are approaching this from a system-wide um, outlook, which will help our disproportionality. If we are all identifying students with, through the same lens, then we will eliminate disproportionality, and that's very much a goal of ours. The last two, um, we will have a countywide approach to functional behavior assessments and behavior intervention plans, and this does come out of um, new legislation that I'll be very excited to come tell you about in a few months, where we have eliminated seclusion, not that we actually had seclusion in the first place, but also they have significantly tightened up um, restraint in the use of public schools, so um, this kind of aligns with that. And then finally, we're going to increase the number of special education students taking and passing technical skill assessments or earning industry recognized credentials um, and that speaks to this to the transition piece so on in your presentation if it's not a PDF if it is I apologize but we do have a copy of this strategic plan and it is a linkable document so you're welcome to to peruse that um, transition is one of the gold standards of special education. It is kind of, you know, the goal of special education is really to provide that meaningful access for our students to transition from our world of grade school to the world of adulthood. And special education is unique because there's a specific plan embedded, embedded within the IEP to get the student from point A to point B. Um, so while it's, it could be academic focus, it could be functional focus, it could be, you know, a professional, you know, lens through which we're looking. The important part is that we're developing that plan for our students and we're helping facilitate success. So our goal continues to be to increase our ability to enroll our students in our internships and apprenticeships. Um, and I am happy to say that currently 50% of all of our high school special education students do participate in CTE courses. So that's, that's a really great thing as well. I promise I'm almost done. Um, another important part of staffing is public input and opportunities for the public to speak towards, you know, what we're able to offer our students as well as the quality of the services that are being provided to them. And we do that through a couple different um, avenues. So we do have our special education citizens advisory committee. We have our family support services where we have a family support liaison who works um, through central office and she reaches out to parents and provides additional support for them. <coughs> And then we also have um, many engagement and outreach opportunities as well, where we host different events and, and whatnot so that parents are informed um, of different opportunities and community organizations within um, both our county as well as neighboring districts. So each year, um, families are asked to participate in a parent survey that is put out uh, through MSDE. We usually have a, an adequate response rate, but I will say that the school age response rate has continued to increase. So we went from 15% to 23% in 2021. Um, and we've had fairly uh, good results. 80% of parents with children receiving special education services reported that school programs were facilitating um, parent involvement as a means of improving services. So. We do take this information and we do use it to better improve upon the, the services that we provide. But we weren't really happy with that. So we took it a step farther. Um, and again, because this is in a PDF, all of my, my images are on top of each other, so I apologize, but we developed an <clears throat> internal survey that we send to parents following IEP meetings to check in and see how their meeting went. We ask them a series of questions and then they respond and we take that data and that feedback and, and really apply it. So questions like, did you feel that you were a meaningful um, and equal participant in the meeting? Do you feel that your needs were met or that your questions were answered, et cetera? And then there is a question at the bottom that says, if you would like to be contacted by someone to discuss this further, please provide your contact information. 
we've had some parents take advantage of that and it was just to give us positive feedback. Like this was the greatest IEP meeting I've ever gone to. I really felt like a member of the team. And on the, the opposite end of that, we've had some people say, I just didn't feel heard. And then we were able to schedule a new meeting and and discuss so that they did feel heard. So we've had good results and good outcomes as a result of that. So Jennifer Christian is our family um, support liaison. And then Mandy Landon is our parent chair for our Special Education Citizens Advisory Council. A federal requirement is that we show and demonstrate that we maintain the level of funding from year to year plus one dollar. And I can, I'm happy to report based on this slide um, that we are and have been able to maintain that funding level from year to year. So finally, we get into the staffing piece of this, which is really an, an analysis of our current staff and our additional needs. Um, so this slide right here lists on the left a breakdown of our current staff and, and kind of where they are and how they are situated, as well as the link to the actual staffing plan itself. And if we look at that a little bit closer, you can see um, on this slide, it's pieced out by school. You have your current enrollment as well as the projected enrollment for 22-23. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, those numbers do change from time to time, um, actually, you know, fairly um, often these days with people that are moving or people that are moving into the district. Um, so, and then in addition to that, you do have students that no longer qualify for a special education or you have a, a, a new student that does qualify for it. So. Mm -hmm. It is a fluid number, but we are projecting um, or proposing that next year we have 46 special educators. Um, and in, on the previous slide, they were all kind of lumped together in one big number. This is just kind of pieced out. Um, 10 IEP chairpersons, 10 um, PACS regional special educators. So those are our teachers that provide services to our more complex students. Four preschool teachers, which is an addition um, an additional one teacher at Ken Island Elementary School. So there would be two at Centerville Elementary and two at Ken Island Elementary. Three Peels um, special educators and then two ACE special educators as well. And then in addition to that, we'll continue our um, partnership with the Midshore Special Education Consortium, which provides our related service um, delivery with the exception of our speech services. And I actually am happy to report that through kind of very strategic staffing with the consortium, we were able to kind of better deploy supports for our infant and toddler position or, or population here, allowing the consortium to provide those supports and we were able to eliminate a part-time contract for the upcoming school year that we actually carried independently of um, or independent of the consortium. And this is the second year we've been able to do that. So last year we discontinued a PT or physical therapy contract. And this year we will, were able to discontinue an occupational therapy contract. So, you know, that's, that's a good thing for us overall. And then finally, um, all of our school psychology positions were provided by direct hires this year. We had zero contracts. Wow. So I look at the smile on your yeah, face. Right. I mean, that was one thing. I um, so I was, I'm was. i very happy to report that as well. Um, and we have a great team behind us there. So questions and hopefully answers. Kudos. Yeah. Thank you. Very well done. I'm glad to see we got people on board now too. That not having a contract, that's a. They've all figured out it's a great place to work. <laughs> you got I do it. have a couple questions. Sure. Is it is it because of that? I know we're increasing our pre-K uh, program. Is that why you're seeing a 10% increase in the number of special education? <laughs> so students? I'm glad you asked that question. So we're actually um, we are piloting a model next year where we are shifting the re the responsibility of our IEP chair. So they will no longer case manage in addition to being the IEP chair. Um, there is a select group of schools that their responsibilities will be to be the compliance, 
coaching, mentoring responsibility in the building. So they will not go in and deliver services to the students themselves. Um, and this will allow them, the, the case managers, to better focus their attention to co-teaching and the instruction that needs to take place. Um, and it, it will allow the IEP chair to focus more on those compliance matters, like getting IEPs out, making sure that we're meeting timelines, deadlines, et cetera. In order to do that, we did have to address a few shortages because we did have one school in particular where the numbers shot up real high. Um, again, a lot of kids came back from COVID this year and there was a school that closed and when they closed, um, we saw an increase there as well. Thanks. And then just one more question on your page 10. Um, when you're talking about what would be other, I mean, it sounds like you're covering a lot. So we have nine students out of our 800 who are at a different facility. Is that correct? Correct. So those are our non-public students. Um, and those are the students that we're not able to provide the, their services here in our district. So they have very complex needs or they have um, very severe behavioral needs kind of as much as I can say about Yeah, that. no, ab no, absolutely. And so, uh, and offhand, just because I know we've gotten, we've moved some monies and things like that over, what do we, do you, would you have an idea of what it is for those nine students for a year or two? It's probably, in each one's individual, but it's very, very expensive because you, 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 well, you right, pay no, intuition. And if you recall, you've, you've actually approved every one of those Well, contracts. I know there was just a whole bunch. And so over the time, we, yeah. I know we've moved some monies and stuff, so I just didn't know if you knew off kind so, of offhand. Uh, I can't. I can I can get you these very specific answer, but to give you the more general answer, so it, it is it does vary from student to student, anywhere from it could be forty five thousand dollars per year up to one hundred and twenty two thousand dollars per year. We pay a portion of that because the state reimburses reimburses us for a portion of that as well. Thank you. Thanks very You're much. Welcome. That was a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other Thank you so much. Thank you. Very, very well done. Thank you. Very informative. Happy summer. Dr. Kibler. Thank you. Good evening, board members, Dr. Salen's executive team. I'm Dr. Kibler. Uh, Director of Accountability, and tonight I uh, have the uh, privilege to present to you a new strategic plan uh, for the district for the next five years. And in case I, I I sort of forget or don't make it clear enough as I go through this, I, I want to say I really have the privilege just to kind of present it here. This has been the work of a lot of people, a lot of people interviewed, um, helping us put this together. Ms. Hudock facilitating um, this with me under Dr. Salen's leadership. So um, I, I just get to sit here and talk about it now. And I know Dr. Salen's later in the summer will present um, um, a sort of a, a bright, beautiful publication for this to, to sort of go out in the world. But tonight, we're just here to show you sort of the, the meat of it and talk a little bit about what we'll, um, what we'll continue working on with this over the coming months. So first, I, I wanted to give a little bit of background on how we got here tonight before we dive into what the strategic plan actually looks like. This is a, we're roughly at about eight months of work right now. We got started end of October, beginning of November with this and we gave an update, I think it was in, in March to you all about where we were, but uh, the Blueprint Advisory Work Group um, was really instrumental in helping guide this project as well, um, just because of the overlap with what we have to do for Maryland, uh, the Blueprint for Maryland's future, um, sort of guiding our strategic work over the next five years. We have an additional subgroup out of that advisory work group that helped draft the pieces of the strategic plan and I'll recognize those folks later um, but that, those kind of the umbrella organization uh, groups that helped with this. Um, what we started with were 35 hours of interviews and focus groups with 150 individuals and kind of a chart there of uh, some of the people we spoke to and that's kind of as, um, as specific as I'll get. We did promise uh, to keep those people anonymous and uh, you know, because we wanted them to be open and honest with us, but we really tried to, to reach a lot of folks as well as with the, the makeup of the Blueprint Advisory Work Group. We really 
talk to a lot of community members, parents, students, families, employees. Um, so a lot of different in pieces of input here. Uh, after all those interviews came the data analysis. Uh, that, that was interesting, so 150 individuals and all those hours of interviews and focus groups trying to take those responses, uh, look, sort of pare down similar responses and then theme those and then try to turn it into what will eventually be, you'll see like the five goals and what's the most important to folks that should be our mission, vision, and values. Um, took a lot of time, multiple drafts, and then to where we're all tonight with a, with a final product to present to you. So the timeline, we're right on this timeline. Um, I didn't know if we'd meet it. I, I knew we would meet it. I was nervous about meeting it. Sorry, Dr. Salem. <laughs> uh, back when we set this in October. So we're right where we want to be, uh, finalizing the mission, vision, values, goals, objectives, portrait of a graduate. And it's moving on to its design phase with uh, Ms. Power Waters. I'm really excited about that. And then we'll start implementing and tracking over the next five years. So with that, our new mission. Queen Anne's County Public Schools, in partnership with families and community members, fosters a learning environment to educate and empower students academically, socially, and emotionally to prepare them for career, college, and life success. And a vision, what we're aspiring to, all students will graduate with the skills necessary to pursue their professional pathway and be empathetic contributors to society. So you'll notice throughout, if you look at sort of the old vision goals, we tried to streamline. We wanted something that people could remember, repeat, um, and would mean something um, personally to them. Our core values, probably my personal favorite part of the new strategic plan. Uh, there are five core values here. They align with the five goals that we'll see on the coming slides. That students' lifelong success is achieved by providing access to engaging and challenging curricula. Well-rounded students thrive when provided a safe and nurturing environment. Students learn best when afforded access to physical, social, and emotional support. Students' investment in their learning is increased with a highly qualified and diverse staff that have different backgrounds and experiences. Students' growth and achievement is built upon family engagement and community partnerships that enrich the educational experience. A new profile of a graduate, uh, if, to be able to realize our vision, it's our hope that our graduates will be adaptable, civic-minded, collaborative, compassionate, effective communicators, motivated, resilient, and self-advocates. And really what we did with, like throughout all of this is taking that data from the interviews and putting this into this here. This is not the work of, of any of us individually. It, it's, it's what the people told us um, from that data analysis. Really a, a, a fun thing to take it from all of that down to, to these. Our goals, you'll, you'll notice that uh, we have just five single words for the goals. Uh, achievement, and that is talking about student achievement. That's, that's what we're here. But our goal is to provide engaging and challenging curricula with experiences and supports that prepare students to be successful after graduation. And I don't know, do, do we want me to read all the objectives or just stick with the goal maybe and, and you all can read that's at your fine. leisure? Goal two, safety, provide a safe environment for all students, staff, families, and community members. And I will say this was, with the achievement, safety really was when we talked to everyone, families, community members, staff, the number one thing that, that folks told us. And these interviews were back in January, February, just for time. Goal three, wellness, support the social, emotional, and physical well-being of students. This goal will actually um, encompass sort of extracurricular activities as well, sports, after school programming. Goal four, the staffing, recruit and retain a diverse workforce. Goal five, engagement. Engage families in the community as partners in our school system to support all students. So just some acknowledgements, because like I said, it was under Dr. Salen's leadership, Ms. Hudak and I facilitating this. We couldn't have done this without uh, Ms. Be Mrs. Betsy Andrews, who's hiding behind the computer up there tonight. Mrs. Lanette Power Waters, um, helping us with all the interviews, setting things up. 
um, again, Mrs. Hudock facilitating this. And then I'd, I'd like to recognize the individual, the little subgroup from the Blueprint Advisory um, work group that help, helped us draft um, these goals for us to take back to the group and the exec team. That was Ms. Mich Michelle McNeil, Ms. Jolene Smith, Ms. Michelle Morissette, Mr. Adam Tolley, and they can be bought just for snacks for those couple <laughs> things. So uh, I really appreciate them taking the time for that. Um, but we couldn't have done it without everybody's help. And we're really excited and happy to take any questions about this. I will say before we get to questions, the next step of this process is now turning this into actions, uh, turning aligning school improvement plans, indicators for the schools to match this, continuing to uh, mesh sort of our work with the blueprint with the strategic plan as we look forward to the next five years. And that's Excellent. probably what, yeah, that's probably what I'm most excited about is the timing was perfect to take the blueprint and the expectations there and completely align that with our strategic plan and then layer on our school improvement plans so that they're a five-year cycle as well. So our schools will be looking at, you know, not just year to year. Um, they're going to be looking at long range. What does it look like um, as it relates to our strategic plan that's tied directly to blueprint? So I can't think you enough for the work mm -hmm. it's been amazing it's a great process to go through and I feel like we really got to hear from the community as a whole our educational community and after coming after this pandemic and everything, you know, we're, we're, we're back in business. Mm -hmm. You know, we're back here in school doing things. And this is just, a, I think, a blueprint to get things running and take off. Mm -hmm. Because two years we've, we've been hurt. It's been, it hasn't been a good good time. But uh, this, this, this uh, is nice. Any other board members? No. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you. Okay, our next items will be action items. Uh, the first thing we've already gone over our human uh, resources report. And next will be our purchase approval for the EDGE. Christine Bentley. I need to pull anything out for this. Second. Um, you don't have you don't to. Pull. Do you have a dispute? Salins, President Smith, board members. I'm here in a different capacity with regards to this, requesting your approval for purchase of contracted services with the EDGE. And this is to um, facilitate direct services for students during our summer PFY program. Um, this is uh, funded through the 21st Century Community Learning Centers grant, which does provide funding for three of our schools for the school year Project A to Z PFY program that we have at Southersville Elementary, Churchill Elementary, and Graysonville Elementary. Um, because of challenges with staffing related to COVID, as well as transitions within the director um, coordinator role with PFY in the 21st Century grant, we um, are somewhat unconventionally um, applying for or had, a, had applied in a, in a challenging timeline for approval for an amendment for, from MSDE, um, which really created even additional challenges with regards to staffing on very short notice for the summer PFY program. So um, the EDGE graciously has um, offered to provide some very specific fitness oriented um, programming, direct instruction with alongside um, some of our the staffing that we are able to um, attain for the program so that we do have full day programs in those three uh, schools, our Title I elementary schools. So this is uh, for $56,700, and this provides the staffing and fitness components, which is a critical element of the requirements of our 21st century grant for this um, opportunity for our elementary students. 
So the EDGE is sending people into our schools to run this? Yes, yes. And it's so a local company too, interesting. They to are say. a local company. Um, this is a unique service that um, that they provide and that they they are providing their, their professional staff specifically with regards to those fitness and health alignments that are written into our grant. Traditionally, the 21st Century Grant was funded and has been funded as a school year program and unspent funds were generally reallocated for summer program, but because of the transitions with regards to leadership in that grant right now, um, we were not able to meet those timelines that historically had been uh, in place. And how are these students, I'm sorry, go ahead. How are these students chosen, I mean, is it from that school or other schools, could, uh, elementary schools can come into that program or? So these are students who are currently enrolled in Churchill Elementary, Graysonville Elementary, and Sillersville Elementary. So our three Title I elementary schools. Those schools are currently served by our school year program for partnering for youth project A to Z, um, which is a unique program different than some of our other elementary schools that have what's referred to as the partnering for youth menu program. Um, and they are all they they've already registered because of the uh, the advance um, planning that was what was for our enrichment and our camp pro and our academic enrichment and our camp programs in the morning these are students that are already going to be there in the morning that now have families have that option of an extended day to be included in that PFY program in the afternoon okay, so those students are already in a program there mm -hmm. Transportation is that a is that a issue or not a transportation is is included in the amendment that we made with MSDE for this. Okay. So this is really to address those programmatic elements, the critical elements for fitness and health, um, and the staffing needs that we have with the challenges that we have for meeting the compliance with the grant and the challenges that we've had with staffing those positions. It does provide a full day opportunity for parents, which at the elementary level is desirable because of daycare. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Helen. Oh, no, no, it's okay. So, I, how many, so it's for three hours, and they're going to put one staff at each of the three schools for those three hours, and then is that what? No, so we are, we are allotting a 12 to 1 ratio. So we're trying to accommodate a 12 to 1 ratio um, between our staff and the PFY staff. Our staff would be more um, supervision and support um, because of the elements of what the EDGE is able to provide in terms of physical fitness. Um, we, we wanted the additional staffing, smaller groups to be able to manage um, the activities that, the, that they will be doing. Um, so in most settings, the, the way the afternoon program is scheduled or is structured is they will finish their morning program, um, which is an academic component. Mm -hmm. That ends at noon. They'll have a lunch period from 12 to 12.30 that is staffed by our staff supervision. And then in the afternoon, there's three rotations where a EDGE um, professional is the primary lead for that, and then we have additional support right. staff. I mean, the to, EDGE is providing one person per Per, per 12 to 15 students. So, how many? so at, at we are budgeted to try to accommodate up to 60 students at Sellersville Elementary and then 45 at Church Hill and at Graysonville. So 150 students total is what we're trying to accommodate. So five, three, three, and five of, from them, they're going to provide, okay. Mm -hmm. And then for how long does that go on? How many weeks is that? That is four weeks. It's four weeks. So it's it's aligned to the same um, period of time as the summer program. Okay. And that also um, includes the program development because that was the other piece of it where we were in the timeline, having the capacity to, to develop and train staff that is also falling under the services that they're providing. So the personnel, what's training hours mean? It says 270 training hours. What is... That, um, that would be expenses incurred to the EDGE for training their staff to be able to facilitate the specific programs that meet our needs for the grant. Okay, and so it's 270 training hours from them, and then the instructional hours are 720 hours. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then their travel expenses, it says one-way travel hours, 240 hours. So we're, what's one-way travel hours? Um, 
from the edge, I'm assuming it's from their facility on Ken Island to our three locations so because they, their services are going to be provided in our schools. And do we look at, at any other uh, fitness facilities to provide this or, or how did we pick the edge? So, so this is a sole source. Um, I don't know, Ms. Towers, if you want to speak to how that decision was. There is not another organization within our community that provides the services that we needed for this. So this we have an established source. relationship with them. Yeah. They're they no, already they're no do provide services with our PFY program and for what we um, needed needed for with regards to the capacity there aren't other providers for that and they had been providing services during the school year. during the school year Couldn't this year find a coordinator at Stevensville so they were providing the what service are they doing outside of fitness professional that we don't that they're that they're the only ones that provided that would qualify for sole source I'm saying there's got to be something that they're doing fitness wise that's not I think it's the youth development aspect of it I think that we don't have so the the 21st century grant specifically has these critical elements that are related to fitness and health so while there are other providers that might be able to um, have fitness and health they also have the youth development aspect of it and they also have the the, the programs that we currently have in PFY so they have that They've already built a structure for meeting those requirements that are very specific to this this federal grant. But we didn't look anywhere else. We're just assuming that they had what we needed. And it, I'm sorry, because I know she asked you, is that what we did? We, we did we like look out and look for somebody else that had this or they kind of were just already there and so we well normally we would um, but because of the short timing this is already a proved vendor that falls under the 21st century so we're kind of limited as far as that aspect is too because you have to have both pieces the fitness and then as well as the we yeah. have so a two-week turnaround on this yeah, amendment two-week turnaround and they're already established they've been offering us services all year long and they meet the needs of the grant specifically um, so th that's why it was kind of a, a you know, it was a but fit. No normally we, we would, but because of the short time period and because of MSD requirements under this grant, they were the qualified one at that time on such a short notice. And, and looking at this with training hours at 270, instruction at 720 at 49,000, you divide that at what it is an hourly rate with, with, with not paying any benefits, that's still, still within the low range of what we would be paying our staff mm -hmm. to be at that facility. So, I mean. Well, it's not even about our staff. I guess I was thinking other fitness staff. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, I don't know enough about if that's a figure or not. You get somebody cheaper or not, but it certainly doesn't look like a, a exorbitant price when you break it down by the hour to me. Too far. I mean, everything's expensive. <laughs> And, and really, the, the other component of it was that capacity to be able to have enough staff to actually have this program where we could offer a full day program for those schools. And that's that is something that traditionally, especially before COVID, that we've been able to provide for our families, that we were kind of in a crunch for in order to be able to do that given the timeline. This is, and, and the rates that are on there because of the approval process for the amendment that we have with 21st Century are rates that have been approved by MSDE through that process as well. Okay. Any other questions? Do I have a motion? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the contract for services provided by the EDGE for Summer Partnering for Youth Project A through Z programs? Fiscal impact dollar amount of $56,700. Budget source the 21st CCLC grant. Thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Nay. That's uh, three to one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Light speed internet. Hector Combs, you're not coming back to ask for a whole lot more money, are you? <laughs> I just didn't want to uh, burn you too much the last time. <laughs> all of my many, oh, little, little many, bites, little bites. Little bites. Orders. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me eat snippets. So, good evening, President Smith, Dr. Salins, team board members. Um, so, I'm here for purchase approval for four separate items. First one being um, light speed internet content filtering. Uh, this one was also purchased or part of the Meek hardware contract. And anybody that's not familiar with Meek, Meek stands for the Maryland Education Enterprise Consortium. 
Numbers include MSDE, Maryland Colleges, the U.S. Navy Academy, all Maryland K-12 public schools and libraries. Uh, they provide us with hardware contracts, software contracts to purchase IT, technology-related services. Uh, all these contracts are awarded through a competitive RP process. Uh, this first one with light speed is our content filtering. This is a process for us involving the use of software to screen or restrict access to web content that may be deemed offensive, inappropriate, dangerous, malicious. Uh, we've been using this since 2010, uh, for the past 12 years. Um, I can tell you with the meet contract, um, based on all our national contracts and the market price, we were receiving a 44% discount based on the average, uh, their, their main cost. So basically this, when, this, when our students or staff are using the internet in our facilities, mm -hmm. this is a filter. Yes, sir. It has nothing to do with our phones. No, sir. It has only to do with our web content in our yep. facilities. Web filtering, yeah. Any questions by the board? Was it called something else before? Was it, or was it, did it have yeah, a different name? Uh, before it was called like TTC traffic control. Thank I think the traffic control was uh, originally and then they um, switched over recognize. to light speed relay. Yeah, I didn't recognize light speed before. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And now they're switched to, everything's kind of switched into DNS cloud filtering. So that way, if a student, it's like now if a student leaves the property, it's still being filtered regardless of their home or at a hotel or at our school systems. They get the same one which is how we have it set up. Any other questions? Entertain a motion. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the purchase of Lightspeed internet content filtering subscription for one year, but uh, fiscal impact dollar amount of $47,080. Budget source is the FY 2023 technology software licensing budget. Second. A motion second, all those favor say aye. Aye. Uh, ayes have it, four of Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not that quick. <laughs> Please. <continue. laughs> the next one is uh, uh, Blackboard. This is uh, purchased directly to the company. They don't really do resellers. Um, this is a renewal of our web hosting subscription. This is hopefully our last year uh, with them as we transition to our new platform. As you've seen, um, we've gotten the board and a few other schools and next year the goal is to get everything to fully transition to this new platform. So this hopefully is the last time for this. Save us some money next year. Okay. <laughs> Questions by the board? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the purchase of the web hosting from Blackboard? Fiscal impact dollar amount of $36,182.03. Budget source is the FY 2023 technology software licensing budget. Second. Uh, motion is second. All those favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Four of them. Okay. You're still uh, on a roll. <laughs> yep. The uh, next one is uh, Microsoft licensing through Bell Tech Logic uh, through the meet contract. This is our annual re renewal of the Microsoft license agreement bundle for our servers and client access. This is like Windows Defender, Microsoft Office, Windows Servers, Windows 10, 11. Um, Meek's been on partner on our behalf with Microsoft since 99, and they give us, they do, we do five year contracts with them to give us set pricing for five years so we can budget for five years at a, at a time. So this is what that provides us, so. I do have a question, Ms. Mm -hmm. Towers. All of these different contracts we were approving have, are already in the budget that we have slated for 2023, correct? There, there is one that's using year-end funds. Okay. Next one. Will be the next one. Okay. But th so far the two and then this right. one are already yes. provided we can get a balanced budget. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? I hear a motion. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the purchase of Microsoft licensing from Bell Te Tech Logics? Yes. Fiscal impact dollar amount of at $62,474.12. Budget source is the FY 2023 technology software licensing budget. Second. A motion is second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Ayes aye. have it. Thank you. 
Okay, and the last one is a one of my IT projects I'm trying to get through, which is our VMware cluster upgrade and standalone host. This is also through the meet contract. Uh, working on replacing our, we have out-of-date servers in our data center that can no longer be updated with VMware, which is our main operating system. It allows us to host 10 more servers on a physical box to save us on hardware cost. Uh, to install some 10 gig switches, uh, we're using one now to increase our communication and uh, for and also upgrading our power school servers, replacing all of them, as well as updating all of our servers at the schools um, to the latest version of vSphere, vSAN, virtual hardware, and the tools. Uh, through the contract on our servers, uh, based on the MSRP price, they are giving us actually a, we're getting 77% uh, discount. Um, on the Juniper switch, we're getting a 72% dis, uh, discount off MSRP. And our licensing, we get anywhere between 50, about 50% and hardware support, we get about 80% discount. Ms. Towers, how are we having $140,000 left over funds? Inside? We, ha we have some savings under salaries and health care. Okay. Hey, what's, I know technology changes faster than we can talk. <laughs> uh, yeah. What's the life expectancy of this stuff? Uh, normally, like the servers, we get about eight years. I try to get about eight years out of a, out of a server. Um, basically, what ends up happening is you lose support for the the software that you're running on. So one of the requirements for VMware is about every year or so, they just don't support the processor inside that CPU anymore. Therefore, you can't, it's kind of like an iPhone, right? You can't have an iPhone with the latest version of iOS because they just don't want to put the drivers and support stuff from eight years ago. Google does the same thing. Like our hardware is like, you got five years and you need to buy a new Chromebook. So they just want, they're limited to you. What, so every eight years, I got to buy new hardware. I want to keep up with the software. And, and, and looking at, you know, year end funds, this isn't a reoccurring cost. This is eight no, years. Sir. I mean, you're looking at hopefully eight years to get yes, this sir. out of here. So that, that softens the blow some there on not knowing that we're not going to, might have to see you again for more money, but not today. Not today. <laughs> Thank you. And we're not having to go into next year's budget. Thanks. I just have a question about just because it's the same comp data works networks as the one we did for the um, security camera <coughs> servers a couple, uh, couple weeks ago, and the had a. Um, we had that was a, also done for the Meek, the Meek Harbor. That was also done for the, the state Harbor, Maryland State Harbor contract. Well, this it was a seven-year on-site service and technical support. Why are we only doing three? How come they're only doing three-year scores on this one? Is it is a servers? I was just trying to fit a, 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 okay. a, a, a cost. I hear. So what will happen? So what happens after three years if we're expecting an eight-year life expectancy? So most of like like Power School is great because we have two servers, so we can. What I want to switch over to is we have a we call redundant set. So if this one fails, this one it'll switch over to this one and still work. If I either try to do a year extension, just do a warranty extension, or if not, then what I'll do is just have to replace the parts. I can do a Chromebook okay. and buy a power supply and buy not a know um, enough about it, but so these servers have nothing to do with our com security camera servers? They're no, not this, be not this. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions by the board? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the purchase of Dell servers and contracted services from Data Networks, uh, fiscal impact dollar amount of $140,390, budget source the FY 2022 end of year funds. Second. Motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank yes, sir. You. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Have a good summer. <laughs> Thanks. Ms. Towers, and you can introduce. Yeah, when I see Josh, I'm like, oh no, how much this time? <laughs> <laughs> you should go. I, I can be bold off you. I can put you in front of him next time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Sounds, board members. I am Jane Towers, uh, CFO. And I'd like to introduce you to Stuart Sutley. He is with Bolton Partners, and he is going to join us for the presentation about advanced primary care. So I'm just going to give a brief um, history or background, and then I'm going to turn turn it over to him so let me pull this up here
So Queen Anne's County Public Schools through ESMIC partnership proposes to implement advanced primary health care center for our workforce and families. ESMIC is our predominant public health plan through the Eastern Shore. ESMIC has been established and around since 1994 and it provides a significant savings with polled group. It's a polled self um, funded type thing where you can bank any savings into a health care trust. So um, this advanced primary care center we will be sharing with the county and it's based upon as far as cost, the number of eligible participants that we would share with the county. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stuart Sutley and he could probably introduce himself a lot better than I just did. <laughs> Great, good evening everybody. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, prior to coming to Bolton Partners, actually earlier this year, I ran the advanced primary care health center business for Johns Hopkins uh, across the country so most people don't know Johns Hopkins worked with employers across the country to put these types of health centers in and so what what we're really here today to talk about is not only a mechanism that uh, I've seen and believe in to control costs for health care but also a great resource for recruiting and retention and I was able to work with uh, Jane and, and the team to help put together some of the information for the Maryland Start State Department of Education grants that you heard about earlier today, where a big part of it was around faculty and staff retention and things that we can do to, to give them better benefits. Um, lastly, I'll say I've just put two of these, worked on two of these within the state of Pennsylvania recently, Spring Grove Area School District and North Penn School District um, are also implementing this exact same strategy um, because of the benefits they see, which, which we'll go through. So I've, I've got a couple quick slides really going to do is kind of just set the background like why the why and then what the actual solution is itself and i'm really glad you're here to do help you with that so um, so one of the, I think the key things to know is that Queen Anne's County is designated by the Health Resources and Administration, Health and Resources Administration as a medically underserved county. Um, that's a national uh, website that looks by county and says based on the number of eligible uh, members or, or you know, lives within that community, um, how many primary care physicians are there. And so as a whole, Queen Anne's County is, is again medically underserved. So what we're seeing, and it comes out in the numbers, is we're seeing, for example, if somebody has wants to get a new doctor and they have an appointment, it's not an urgent care, the wait time today is about 56 days. Um, you, we all know what happens over 56 days. All of a sudden that appointment gets close and I've got some Something else to do so um, a lot of people actually miss these and what we're seeing is that nationally people are starting to use urgent care in a replacement for primary care because it's so challenging to get access to primary care today so we're seeing increases in, and quite honestly we've seen within your own benefits plan an increase in the use of urgent care and it's a decline in the use of primary care and again some of that is access some of it is time some of it is cost um, but when you combine it all together that's not helping us really manage your workforce and defend dependence from a health standpoint we also are seeing um, a, a big increase in your spend as the public schools around behavioral health and these health centers are really great for that so listen primary care is very challenged right now um, wonderful people that are primary care physicians, but they are retiring faster than they're coming into the profession. Uh, so that's a challenge today. Um, most uh, people who go through medical school do not want to go into primary care because they can't make what their peers can in other specialty services. So we're really challenged as a nation with a lack of access. Um, and when you, we do have that access, 80% uh, of all doctors today in primary care are owned owned by health systems. So for example, UMS has a lot of physicians they own, uh, and those physicians are compensated based on volume. How many people can I get through my office in a day because of fee for service, and how many referrals can I make to specialty care? And they are bonused on that. So again, it's the model, it's not the doctors, it's the system they're in that has a perverse incentive compared to helping all of us who want to spend time with a doctor, get the right referrals, et cetera. So we've got a challenge 
with that. And, and keep going to the next one. There is also provider burnout that we've seen, obviously, with you know, the results of COVID. So we have, at Bolt, we have spent uh, a lot of time looking at all the various resources that are out there, and we have selected a vendor who we uh, took to ESMEC. Um, ESMEC helped us put a contract together, a master contract. We put performance guarantees in so that we could bring to, you know, to Queen Anne's County Public Schools and the county itself uh, access to this, what's called advanced primary care, which really allows you as the patient to spend more time with your doctor, typically 30 to 45 minutes, not 10 to 15. Um, same day, next day appointments. Also the ability to really look at other things that are pressing like mental health needs open to two-year-olds and up. So one of the best resources that these uh, health centers do, typically at the end of August, is all the back-to-school physicals for faculty and staff, the sports physicals, things that we all are rushed and don't get to. So there's lots of benefits to this from the standpoint, again, of convenience, access, et cetera. Uh, and it complements the health plan. So I think one of the things that we, we, wanted, we wanted to really talk about today is, you know, who is the vendor we chose and a little bit about the services they offer. Uh, Everside is a national firm that are the second largest advanced primary care firm in the, uh, company in the country. They have about 400 health centers and growing. Um, so it's their staff, they hire, they manage, they would help identify with you all uh, a location to put the health center. They do all the permitting, the construction requirements, make sure everything is done. Again, hire the staff, manage the operation, and it's open access, again, to everybody who's eligible. Um, we also did yesterday do the same presentation to the county, and they, they did approve this. So again, this is a combination of putting the two groups together. I know this is a little bit of eye chart, but it actually serves the purpose of, these are all the services that are available. So today, when you look at all the services that are of access to the faculty and staff, um, I kind of call this a variable cost. You, your health plan allows everybody to have access to all this, but we don't know what they're buying and spending until you get the bill at the end of the month or two months from, from the carrier. We're now taking all these services and actually fixing them. So for this, for a uh, flat fee per month, uh, all these services are available no matter how many times somebody uses the health center. They could use it once, they could use it 10 times. And we get a lot of people that do use this often when they see the convenience and the ease. So I want you to start thinking about the fact that what we're able to start doing and is taking a, a big variable expense in your healthcare and over time starting to fix it, which obviously has great impact in the future increases of your healthcare costs. So again, another great benefit. And there are services that are in here too that you're, you're potentially spending money on outside of just traditional healthcare. DOT exams, for example, for bus drivers. Um, any other type of expenses that you might be doing around occupational health and things can be captured within this operation. Uh, there's a lot of great statistics that are done. One of the reasons why Bolton we chose Everside was because they use Milliman, which is a, a, a international actuarial firm to actually validate all their numbers. So these aren't self-reported numbers. And we see lots of benefits with patient outcomes, um, better management of people, net promoter scores, which obviously means patient satisfaction, um, and again, just overall health improvements. So that was one thing that was important. Um, the other thing that was really important, and I like actually this one, this stat more than any of them, is that 76% of employees have an approved opinion of their employer with access to these services. So when we're talking about recruiting and retention, I think this is a really critical piece, and it was part of the piece we really hit home in the Maryland State um, Department of Education grant process. Uh, and then besides the savings to you all, there's the savings to the individual. So they're not making out of um, pocket co-pays. They're not going to unnecessary uh, referrals to specialty care, the time spent, et cetera. So we took through the uh, ESMEC and, and working with your carrier, we took three years of claims history with the county and we ran it through uh, a 
return on investment uh, assumptions that were made based on the 700,000 lives that Everside already manages. Everside has the largest book of municipalities and school districts in the country, so it's a very relevant population. And not only did we do this um, ROI analysis, which was very favorable, and if you see them the small print in the lower right, um, significant savings over years because we are, again, shifting this variable expense to fixed. But also we were able to, I think, negotiate some very um, specific and positive performance guarantees in the contract around things like utilization, patient satisfaction, clinical outcomes, and the return on investment. So the vendor we have chosen does have skin in the game and will be held accountable to those performance guarantees. Um, the funding sources, uh, again, been very fortunate with the dollars that were awarded through the grants. We worked with Everside to also have them be an approved vendor within the MSD grants so that they're already a proof, proof, approved provider. Uh, so besides those dollars, there's also the reserves that you have. So this is not additional dollars. This is existing dollars that are already there through reserves and through the grant dollars. What I, what I know you will see, and I've done this a long time, is that you get through the first 18 months or so and we're all working together to drive that utilization, you'll then kind of cross that bridge to where you'll have the positive return on investment and really start to see that this is saving you money, a, a lot more money versus what you are putting out on it on an annual basis. So I personally think this is where healthcare is going and should go. I think it's a great asset for your faculty and staff and their families. And uh, if there's any questions about the presentation itself or any specifics, please ask. And Thank you. If I can add a couple things say, yeah. too. Yeah, um, couple if things. an employee is already currently satisfied with their primary provider, they can stay with the primary provider. It, it is not um, mandatory that they switch. This is another um, option for them to have. And as you know, just this past year for fiscal year 23, we had to use 1.6 in reserves just to get the rates down because we're seeing the rates climb at you know last or over two million dollars. So we, this is a really good way to look at how to try to control those increases so we don't have to keep doing from reserves because as you know, reserves, one time money, you keep chipping away every year, you're gonna have nothing. So. And, and to complement the, the statement she made, because it actually was a question yesterday, you know, we, again, we are not at, not saying somebody has to drop their existing physician relationship. Actually, what we have found in every community we go into and put these in, the, the primary care physicians out there today are, are booked. They have more patients than they know what to do with. So what we actually do is with the, the patient or the faculty member, for example's permission, is we'll reach out to that person's doctor, and let's say that they're diabetic and living with diabetes, we'll work with that doctor to help manage that doctor's care plan. And the doctors love it because they don't get paid additional money to have touch points with somebody during the point of the case of a year. So that ability to collaborate with some of your higher risk members who already have primary care is really a big benefit to the physicians in the community, but also to the patient and a better management of that cost. And, and I also should have mentioned, I, I think if you look at the providers across the country today in this model, the majority of them are taking on a lot of mental health questions. And they're there to help listen and to help steer and help find appropriate resources, which we know is a very big challenge today. So I think that's another wonderful benefit of the program. And one thing, and I've been to a couple of these meetings and I think Dr. Sandlins and Ms. Tower could say, this is not gonna be based in our, it's with the county because we're all in the same healthcare program. It's gonna be a facility outside of the schools. It's gonna be a standalone facility somewhere. So anybody that's in this program could go to it, but it's gonna be that. Yes, sir. And it is completely different yeah, than our uh, in-house thing where we're having with our students that we're working right. with the different so things. And that was the clarifying point that I wanted to make. So we're implementing three school-based health centers um, in some of our needier areas in the district. And those programs are designed to meet the needs of students 
students. While staff can access those um, services, the primary reason of school-based health centers is to serve students during school hours within our school building. This primary purpose of this program is to serve our, our staff outside of the school building at times that are convenient for them. So you'll see hours that will be earlier um, on some days of the week so that they can access it before they go to work. We'll have maybe one or two days where we'll have extended hours so that they can seek you know, services after outside of the school day. Um, so this is a true partnership with the county. It is supported by MABE. It is endorsed by MABE. Um, we are the first ones on the shore, but we have included everyone on the shore because we have projections of the impact. <coughs> and as was stated, Everside is nationally um, known. And so the best part about that is uh, our staff members, if they're anywhere, they can access the same exact care as if they were right here. So if we have a teacher that's employed with us that say lives in Dorchester County um, and there's a new Everside there as we expand out, they can seek services there within their own county that they live, even though they are a faculty member here or a staff member here in Queen Anne's County. Um, I, I support it 100%. I, I definitely, um, you know, look to the comments that Jane made. made. $1.6 million out of our reserves is a huge amount of money. Um, healthcare continues to rise every single year at about a 10% rate. And so our staff would have had to absorb that 10% rate but using the $1.6 million brought it down to 4%. We can't continue to use reserves to bring it down and bring it down and bring it down. We have to fix costs. And this is the only way for us to control those fixed costs. And it's not reducing the service. Matter of fact, it's, it's enhancing, enhancing the service. The service. Yes, sir. yes, sir, correct. And no co-pays. And no co-pays, <laughs> right. It's huge for employees. It is huge for employees, it is. And this is not open to the public, because I think, uh, just saying. Not open to the public. Yeah, Pre President Smith, uh, just to make sure it's clear to it, this is only those employers that are in this. So, in our, in our system, yes, sir, and the, and the county and the school board, the board of education has the same insurance provider. Correct. That's yes, why yeah. that's combined there. And we can add partners eventually if we if we want to, like Chesapeake College, we could offer them to come in and partner with us, which would ultimately reduce our costs. Um, but right now, it, it will just be the county and the um, school district. Any other board members have some questions? Yeah. No, we've had several conversations on this before, and uh, everything I heard tonight just reinforces, you know, I, I think it's a good program, and uh, it'll benefit the, the system for sure. Okay. And when we, I, it's in here, it says the Leeds grant, which is a major funding source of this, yes. and potential health care reserves, and that could be in collaboration with the county because we work with them, so that would be a partnership there if we, if we, and it looks like we could tap into those, that'd be a joint effort there. And that's a really good point because sure. this is a heavy lift on the front end, so, um, you know, kudos to the system for applying for all seven of the strategies and getting this, and actually the state was so intrigued by it. They, they you know, asked questions about this specifically because they hadn't heard of this before and when you start to look at community schools and community school systems this falls in line with that as well you know for the for the community as a whole as we know many of our staff members live right here in our community so it does really become a community thing um, so the startup fees um, come from the grant and that's about seven hundred thousand um, dollars and then the whole goal is to reduce costs over the next four to five years um, so the part with the county so we do the startup fees the county comes in but remember we're starting to reduce those health care costs all the way around the line so you, you should in five years not see those dramatic increases where we wouldn't have to go to fund balance we wouldn't have to ask the district you know right. it, it's another way to help control those costs awesome. over the next couple yeah. of years and it's you're enhancing the service I mean this you're reducing another the cost but you're enhancing mm -hmm. like you like you were upside you know these doc they, you got somebody to see not wait 56 days or whatever it is to get a hold of somebody yes, sir. It's, to me that's a quick you address a problem it, it didn't get any bigger or does, at least you know what you got right yeah. Okay, any other questions by the yeah, board? Yeah, I do. I, so let me understand this because I've not been a part of any of the mm -hmm. meetings. So the actual contract is with Everside Health? Correct. And who do you represent? Bolton, so I'm part of the team that helps manage the, your benefits plan with ASMEC. Okay, thank you. I, I, I didn't get that. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, and Bolton.
Holton also, I mean, approved Everside. I mean, they were yes. totally on board. Yes, yeah, so and we worked with ESMEC and, and the team to put together the contract, the performance guarantees. We negotiated that on, on everybody's behalf. I was wondering how you got paid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. That clarifies that. Still, the Leeds grant, how much of that are we using a huge portion of that to 700,000 out of this or 6.8 million. Uh, okay. Yes. We applied for that particular strategy. We, we applied for the, the most money that we could within that strategy. So you could only apply some strategy. You could apply for more money than others. Some was very minimum money actually. And I think kind of Christine went into that, that all of the strategies kind of overlapped and right. some were more supported with monies where some were more supported with strategies. And so um, in this particular one, we got, money. got as much money as we could. The timing to, was to good. Ti the timing was good. The timing's good. Yeah, the timing worked very well. Okay, so thank you. Yes. Helen, Mark, Tammy. I hear a motion. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve uh, the contract with Everside Health uh, in fiscal impact dollar amount of $693,130. Uh, budget source is Maryland Leeds Grant and ESMEC Healthcare Reserve. Second. A motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that would be a big benefit nice to our employees you. and everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Is that it? Oh. Got three no. more. No. <laughs> That'd be quick. <laughs> uh -huh. I just make the motions and we'll just keep going. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks, Thanks for sticking again. around. Have a good night. Okay, Mr. Sid Pender. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Salins, board members for the record, Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer. Um, tonight, I bring before you a um, approval of a contract with OEM Support Services to purchase and install um, a variable frequency drive, um, Corel controllers, and P Connect cards for the energy recovery units at Stevensville Middle School. Um, basically, to kind of explain it, <laughs> What you have at Stevensville Middle School, um, unlike your house, you recirculate the same air over and over and over. With the school, we're required to bring in outside air. Um, the current system that they have there now basically brings in outside air, full throttle. We have to condition it, heat it, cool it down um, with an energy recovery system, basically your fresh air is coming in, mixing with your air going out, so you're reducing your cost to cool it or heat it because basically you're using that energy right there to, um, to overcome that. And with the variable frequency drive, it will not be running at 100% full throttle. You know, it will go up to where it needs to be and throttle back down again, you know, saving uh, some energy on there. Um, this is a uh, physical impact of $36,913 um, for FY22 maintenance unrestricted. This is a sole source um, provider. Um, the uh, OEM is the Mid-Atlantic um, distributor for Green Heck uh, equipment, and there is a sole source provider sheet attached with that, uh, indicating that. Any questions? And this is compatible with what, I mean, I, I you say Johnson Control, so, so compatible with, what, with our systems, because we've had this question come up before. So what you have at Stevensville Middle School is a mixture of different control. One company controls, you have the equipment, um, and then you have basically the infrastructure of the EMS system. Um, with having this put in there, the, it's able to interface with it, kind of like a back net uh, system, and it's able to communicate with it. So yes, you're able to go that way with it. You know, in all honesty, this is something that should have been done um, when you know it was constructed. Um, I, I want to give kudos to Jim O'Donnell for really digging through this, and you know, you can get about 15 years out of this. So if you're looking at it, I mean, it, it breaks it down to about $205 a month. And, and a motor starting, starting uses your energy constant, you know, oh, yeah. once it's running at And we have, we have this in most of our school systems. Okay. Now, this is the kind of system that we have. 
Any questions? Any board members? Yeah. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the contract with OEM support services for everything that Mr. Pinder just said. Fiscal impact dollar amount of $36,913. Budget source FY22 maintenance unrestricted fund. Second. Motion second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Aye. Thank you. And the last one I have, um, seeking approval of a contract with the Aegis Floor Life Weirs Flooring to clean and seal all wood and rubber gym dance floors, uh, stage floors uh, with own, uh, within the Queen Anne's County Public School System. And basically, this is something we do every single year except for the past two years because of COVID. Um, we did have three um, quotes turned in. Um, Weir's flooring was the, the lowest. Um, we have done work with Weir's uh, before. Um, it's been in business for 40 years. They do University of Maryland, pretty much the whole mid-Atlantic um, area. So any questions with that? It's getting done this summer. Yep. I said one. How often do we do we have to do this every year? We do it every okay. single year. Thanks. It, um, and what you got to be careful for is you can get quite a few quotes, but a lot of companies outsource it. So I try to stay with the ones that are actually doing the work, and so we don't have to outsource. You know, deal with a secondary company. Any other questions? So Mrs. Towers, did we put this in the? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. 23 up. This is in the FY23 budget. Yes, it is in there. Okay. I don't want to answer it for her, but yeah. Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure we had it budgeted. Okay. May I make a motion, sir, to approve the contract with Aegis Floor Life Wires Flooring? Do all of our schools for the impact, fiscal impact dollar amount of $50,694. Budget source is the FY23 operating budget. Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Ayes have it. All right, I'm done. Up, up, up. I got one more question for you. Uh, Canopy. I'm going to let oh, no, Ms. pull it. He's gonna oh, right. I'm bringing in heavy hitters. I'm sorry. <laughs> heavy somebody, put, somebody put your name on that. Somebody that's above your pay grade? Yeah. <laughs> Good evening again, Carla Pullen, Facilities Planner, here this evening to request your approval to do soda blasting and painting for the side entrance canopies to our stadium side, as well as our student parking side at Ken Island High School, as well as the rear loading dock. If some of you may recall, two years ago, we were able to do the same effort at the front of the building, and not only is it a real pick-me-up to the building aesthetically, but if we don't have the materials covered in a proper manner, Manner, and we have a lot of peeling paint, which we do at this point in a marine environment that can be really damaging, such as what we have at Ken Island High School. So we're proposing to use the source well cooperative purchasing contract, which we have used for many of our other facilities projects. Um, they will be blasting and repainting all of the metal structures at the locations that were so noted. This is an impact dollar amount of $120,148.72 coming from two different funding sources, capital outlay and year-end funds from fiscal year 22. Thank you for sticking around, Ms. Carla. <laughs> and this, this solves our other problem with the entrance that we took the long route yes. for graduation. Yes. yes. <laughs> so as soon as we, we get this done, route. the bird netting will go up and that will solve that problem. That Appreciate will be that. part of the installation. As they have the lift out there, we will replace that netting. Gotcha. Any further questions? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to accept the contract for a soda blast and repaint, uh, repainting at Kennon High School, fiscal impact dollar amount $120,148.72, budget source FY22, capital outlay of $50,000, and FY22 year end funds of $70,148.72. Second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, ayes have it. Thank you all. Thank you. That's Thank you. the end of our things there. Our future meetings, we will have our regular meeting on July the 13th. Which is one week out uh, than the previous uh, first uh, Wednesday of the month, only because of July the 4th. And then we will have our work session scheduled on July the 20th uh, uh, for the next meeting. Any other things to the board? Do I have a motion? Uh, one question, sir. We have not finalized our budget. So are we meeting next Wednesday if once we. Our budget, I thought we did our. 
Yeah, I mean, it's the budget's already, yeah, it's done. We don't have to. It was funded. Re it was totally funded. Yeah, they, the, they um, voted on their budget last night. So we, 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 don't, we don't have final numbers from the state, they, so we can't finalize ours, but their numbers are finalized at 1.5 million above maintenance of effort, whatever maintenance of effort is. And so... Right. Uh, the, the numbers for state aid are still in with, draft form. Are still in draft form. We should get the final this week, is what we're told. It well, may change by twenty-seven dollars, but that would be it as far as state. I'm aid. only asking if we have to come back here next Wednesday to do any modifications. No, because it was the approved state aid. It was approved in March, and it, and we got fully funded. If there's something that changes, then we would alert the board, and we would have to come back to rearrange and readjust our budget. But the budget's been approved in March. Here, it was approved last night by the county commissioners, and as long as our maintenance effort doesn't change as of today with new numbers that are supposed to come out, we shouldn't have to meet again. Okay. So we've approved the budget. We've sent it to the county. Yes. It was funded. Mm -hmm. If anything changes, we will. May have to have our, a yes. meeting next but week. Only because the state hasn't done final numbers, but. If Correct. It's, you know, Still waiting. Yeah. But right now, we're our current budget. This board passed. It's what the budget we're going to work with next year. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Any other for good for the calls? <laughs> All those in favor? I need a motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> motion to close. Yes. <laughs>